Duran, how are you? You're on mute. Can you see me and hear me okay? I can indeed. Okay, good. You're looking very sharp. Thank you, thank you. All right, I'll stay on mute for the rest of the time. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'll be right back. So I asked uh, KR to um, uh, police the Zoom user list and other mutes and other issues. Awesome. Hi, Heather. Hi, Gaurav. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Could somebody out there tell me if the video is working? Yep, yeah, it sure okay. is. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's working. I'm having trouble seeing it on my side, so it's fine. I'll just pretend it's working. I'll just assume it's working. You're giving away your thunder on slide one, Ryan. <laughs> it's a sneak peek. <laughs> it's a preview. So let's see, from your committee, Heather is here, Joseph is here. Uh, are we Let's here? Is uh, uh, Joseph, Heather, Stefanos, Korov? Is SK here, SK Gupta? No, I don't think so. Uh, also and, Carol. And has Carol joined? Uh, there's SK, all right. I think we're just waiting for Carol. Okay, awesome. Wow. Ah, okay. Thank you. I think you have everyone now, right? I think, Ryan, you, you. I think so. More or less, have the whole committee. Um, there might be some other. This is a well-attended defense. <laughs> I guess so. Okay. So then. Uh, uh, does KR also have co-hosts so she can let people in if they are in the waiting room? Yeah. Yes, she is a co-host. Awesome. That's great. Um, okay, so then welcome everyone to Ryan Julian's thesis defense. Uh, 
once again, we are forced to do this in this setting, um, but we're going to make the best of it and see some wonderful work that Ryan has done over the past four years. Um, so what we used to do when we did this in person is we would ask the audience to leave the room and have a short committee discussion before the uh, candidate gave the talk. If the committee is okay, I would like to suggest that we have Ryan simply give his talk and we'll invite audience questions followed by committee questions. Um, and then we'll have a committee private session with Ryan and then we can have the committee discussion at the end. So uh, if anybody from the committee would like to proceed otherwise, please speak up. Otherwise we'll go with this as the, as the flow. Okay. So yeah, thanks for thanks for agreeing. I think it just makes it a little bit easier. So, all right. So with that said, I think Ryan, the floor is yours. Please aim for about 45 to 50 minutes if you aren't interrupted. Uh, but of course you will be interrupted. So it'll go as, as long as, as it naturally goes. Um, and take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much, Gaurav. Uh, and you know, thank you for being a great host and a great advisor. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, take, today I'm going to talk about algorithms and systems for continual robot learning, a case study in spinning up the AI flywheel. Um, and it, the title is Algorithms and Systems, not just because I like working on algorithms and systems, although I do, but it's because I firmly believe that we can only make progress in this very difficult challenges, challenge by focusing on both. So my thesis is a case study in one way to go about robot learning research, which seeks to ensure that we continue to make meaningful progress on new challenges, such as continual learning, and it's predicated on the idea that progress is not assured. And then in fact, it's quite easy for robot learning progress to stall, but that there's a process, specifically a cycle we can follow, which will help us avoid that. And if we avoid that, we can continue to achieve new capabilities such as continual learning. So this presentation will illustrate what I mean by following one such cycle. Now I refer to this thing, uh, like I refer to this thing called the AI flywheel. And here's a little cartoon of it. So you can start anywhere, but I, I really believe the best place to start is with benchmarks. And to make a benchmark, what you do is you look at the real world, you decide what you wanna do, you encode that unambiguously in a well-defined challenge with measurable results, and then you measure your, and this allows you to measure your progress as you go. Now, the next node in this, in this journey uh, is, you know, for a big challenge, we usually don't have the systems we need to satisfy the challenge. And I refer to those systems as baselines, because I believe the best way to build them is to first take the approaches you already have, your baselines, however inadequate, put them into one system. And this allows you to take your current approaches, test them on the new challenge, and see what's failing. Often you'll find you need to improve the systems themselves so you can address a challenge, probably a larger challenge than what you've seen before. And by the time, and once you've improved your systems, this starts to this starts to point you towards novel methods. You can look at why are our current methods failing? How are our current methods failing? Once you're able to actually execute them on a new challenge. Now, once you've done this, you can start to take a look at novel methods. And, th and this process makes looking at novel methods easier because now you've defined success and you have a way of executing your ideas on this new challenge. Once you have novel methods that you feel are really good, well, you should take them and you should put them into the real world. You should test them. You can find out what you should find out what they still can't do. And this allows you to make a new benchmark and then you repeat the cycle over and over again. So in this presentation, I'm gonna take you along one ride around the cycle, which was my PhD, and our, typical, uh, and our topic is gonna to be continually learning robots. So first let's take, a, take one step back and ask, you know, why, why do I care about robot learning? Like, why should we care? So here are a few reasons you might care. So one reason you might say you care about robot, robot learning is that you believe that programming robots is too hard. And, excuse me, while, we're program while programming robots is quite hard, we're getting really good at it. So you can see that in this, in this uh, animation here of the Atlas robot, which doesn't have any learning at all. So I would say it's probably not that programming robots is, are, is too hard. Another reason why you might care about robot learning is that you might believe that learning is faster than programming. And I don't really think that's true today. You know, it might probably takes you at least a year to build a good robot grasping system, which uses learning. And you might be able to build that, that grasping system with, you know, ROS and off the shelf components and, I don't know, a few weeks to a month. So at least right now, learning is not faster than programming. At best, it takes about the same amount of time to build such a system. And the last reason why you might care about learning robots is that you might believe that learning robots work better. 
And I'm sad to say that at least initially, learning robots don't work better. Probably the best robot learning systems we have today, which are probably used for bin picking and grasping, they do about as well as hand program systems and they're starting to get a little bit better, but in general, they, they just don't initially perform better than program systems. Okay, so if it's not easier and it's not faster and it doesn't work better, then why on earth do we care about ro learning robots? So I argue that the reason that we should care about learning robots is that we want robots which can improve over time. All of the programmed robot systems, when you deploy them, if they have a failure, they're not gonna get better without human intervention. But a learning robot has, has the promise of learning continually, right? We can deploy it to, env to environments that designers never intended it for. You know, it could live in homes or offices or other unstructured environments. And, this, and a learning robot should be able to change with the changing world. So let me be a little bit more precise about what I mean by a continual learning robot, because there are many ways to build such a thing, right? We're gonna focus on just one, one version of a continual learning robot in this presentation. So the continual learning ro robots I'm talking about in this presentation, they really have, uh, they have four properties. So the first problem, property is that they're, they're multitask. So this means that we want them to be able to acquire more than one manipulation task. And we want those manipulation tasks to have meaningful structural variation. By meaningful structural variation, I mean that the different tasks should be kinematically different manipulation tasks. Uh, so a counterexample would be uh, grasping something from the left side of a bin versus the right side of a bin. Those are really kind of the, those are really the same skill. So meaningful structural variation would be like picking up a cup versus opening a door. Another property of our robots is that we're going to consider them as uh, their lives as being episodic. So that just means that the experience they uh, that they have, it comes in time delineated chunks. And we're gonna assume that each of those time delineated chunks addresses a single task at a time. It doesn't have to be that way, but this makes it a little bit simpler to think about. Uh, another important property of a robots is that we want their learning to be never ending. So they're gonna repeatedly acquire new tasks and we're gonna hopefully use new skills, sorry, excuse me, use skills that they already have to learn new tasks. And a last kind of detail about, about my, uh, a formulation here today is that we'll assume that in general, these robots can be off policy. And this means that in general, for learning the future, they can use, uh, they can use data that they've collected in the past if they'd like. Now we're not gonna get really heavy in the notation today, but in the following diagram, I'm gonna use a little, I'm gonna have some symbols. So let me just give you a quick inventory of some elements of our robot system. So we're gonna consider T a space of tasks that are of interest uh, that we wanna perform with this robot. When we refer to D, that'll be a data set. And then B is a, is a different kind of data. That's any data that an algorithm decides it wants to keep around, including the parameters of some policy or Q function or, or the model. Then we also have the model itself. And then uh, we'll refer to A as an algorithm which, which uh, will update the model given some data. And that algorithm also decides which information which, uh, to keep around between uh, episodes in this robot's life. Excuse me. And then lastly, there's R the return. So this is our goal, and we want to maximize the return of the model the robot is learning on the task T. Okay, so how do we teach a continuous learning robot? Well, we're going to, uh, so for the purposes of this presentation, we're, I'm going to use this formulation where we consider, consider continual learning to be a form of repeated adaptation. So here's what this looks like. Uh, we first imagine that there can be a stage where we do pre-training. So we start with a space of tasks that we use for pre-training. This is before the robot is deployed and starts doing continual learning. So first we collect some pre-training data. We uh, fit a model to that data, right? A policy or a Q function, a controller that allows our robot to execute a skill to solve a task, right? And so far this pretty much is what uh, regular imitation learning or reinforcement learning looks like. But of course, this isn't the end of the story because we're a continual learning robot. So after pre-training, there comes a new task. We're deployed and it's time to learn a new task. We collect new data. We take that new data and we combine it with the models and possibly some other data stored by the pre-training to adapt a model to create a model that, uh, that solves the new task. And then we take that model and we deploy it, right? So we're gonna see what the performance of this, uh, this new controller on the new task that's been adapted is. Now, of course, this deployment actually generates new data so we can use it to improve ourselves. And because we're a continual learning robot, we're gonna continue learning new tasks. When we learn new tasks, we're gonna keep reusing the model or models and the data buffer or data buffers from our previous, uh, from the previous epochs of our life. And of course, we do this over and over and over again. Hopefully it's never ending. 
Now, if I take this diagram and I unroll it, you can see that the robot's life uh, proceeds over time from left to right, and it's divided into episodes, which are individual experiences on a single task, and epics, which is what I'm going to use to refer to uh, periods of the robot's life where it is addressing a single task. So when we transition from T1 to T2, that's an epic transition. Now, I've told you why you would want a continual learning robot, and I told you a little bit about how you could do a continual learning robot, but I haven't defined success. So here's success, uh, and there's really three prongs for me. You want to maximize performance, of course, so you want to do as well as you can on the task that you're going to do. You want to minimize forgetting, and this means that when you learn a new task, you know, optimally, you don't forget at all, or at least you forget as little as possible how to do previous tasks. And a third and important prong is sample efficiency. So you want it to be that learning continually is more efficient, uses fewer environment samples than learning from scratch. And the reason you want that is that if that was not the case, then you could simply learn a policy independently for each task you'd like to do and call that a continual learner. But that's not the degenerate case of continual learning we're interested in. We're interested in the case where it's more efficient to adapt. Okay, so given that formulation, let me tell you a little bit about the work I've done over the last four years to get us closer to that goal. So first, let's ask, where are we today? Now, I want to really acknowledge that, you know, robot learning is not some new thing that's a break from an old guard. You know, one of the seminal works in robotics is this paper by Rujina Baichi from 1988 about active perception. And it says that a core distinguishing feature of robotics, as opposed to, as opposed to control, is that robots can use their interaction with the real world to improve their decision-making power in that world. And we can follow a thread, you know, from recent works from, uh, you know, from this department even, you know, Peter Pastor and Jan Peters and Stefan Schall and, and uh, other places like Peter Abiel and you have Drew Bagnell and Chris Atkinson, you go all the way back to Rujina. And the reason to tear of all of this robot learning research has always been the promise of continual improvement. But our story begins somewhere around 2013 when deep learning starts to make big strides in computer vision. And people start asking if we could use the same technology for robot learning. So now we're going to start, I promise you, we're going to take you on one cycle around this journey. So now we're going to start on our journey. And excuse me. And we're going to take, uh, we're going to start with a project that uh, looked at uh, task embeddings. So the motivation for this work came from promising new work in pure machine learning and reinforcement learning about representation learning. This work applied representation learning to reinforcement learning to learn reusable and composable representations of tasks. I wanted to find out if we could apply this to real robots, specifically if we could make real robot learning more efficient using it. And I believe that this composition idea is really key to scalable data-driven learning. Robots are limited in scope. You know, a given robot has a small number of fundamental manipulation skills it can do. You know, it's probably less than 10, certainly less than 100. And I'm going to call those skills. And if we if we can do this decomposition, then we can phrase most useful things a robot can do as a choreographed composition of these skills. This leads to simplicity. You know, simple policies are easier to train and they're more robust to transfer. And you can see that in this, this cartoon of, of learning curves. Okay, so in this project, we took this new capability from pure reinforcement learning and, and uh, machine learning, and we put it onto real robots that were learning to do tasks in a simulation, sim, sim to real setting, simulation to real. And so the question is, can we use sim, uh, can we make sim to real learning more efficient by using skill representations? Now, overall conclusion was yes. And the reason was that we is that this representation learning idea allows us to separate skills from their controllers by learning a parameterization of what the robot can do. The representation is grounded in semantics rather than physics. And so, and so it's the same between the simulation and real. Decomposition makes the controller simpler and therefore easier to transfer, even though transferring the controllers in this case does take work because you need to go from simulation to real. But once transferred, you can use the representation to compose and sequence an infinite number of skills in the real world with little or no additional training because you transferred those skills and you have the representations. So in the upper right-hand corner, you can see an example of this. The robot in the upper right uh, learns to, uh, in, in pre-training only learns to reach to six different points in the space. And we also learn a representation of those policies. And what you're seeing is that in, in the real world, after we transfer these six reaching policies from simulation, we're using it to learn how to draw a triangle very, very quickly in 20 minutes of real robot time by reusing this representation. And usually with a real robot, if we were to do this training process on a real robot, this would take hours or days of training time. 
Now, as we made this work more advanced, we went from more uh, manual or search-based ways of composing these representations to defining automatic ways of defining these, these, uh, these representations. And so we defined a, a general procedure that will allow you to uh, completely online adapt the skill library you have that's parameterized by these representations to brand new tasks with very little, uh, very, very, very few uh, new robot samples, just a few, which is why we can do it online. And so you can see in the upper right hand corner, this robot has uh, learned to push the box up, down, left and right in simulation. We transfer those policies along with the representation. In the real world online, it's pushing the box to the upper right hand corner, which is a place it's never seen before. And it's composing an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary sequence of these skills. And this appeared, this work appeared in IJR art last year. Okay, so next station in our journey is benchmarks. And uh, this project and this previous project was about one of my big interests, which is inter-skill adaptation, which is adapting between skills, not, not between goals within a skill, you know, skill to skill, not goal to goal. A big lesson learned from that previous project is that there are really no good benchmarks available for this kind of skill skill adaptation. And inventing our own half-heartedly while addressing the main research question really slowed us down. So I joined up with some researchers at a few other institutions, and we made a benchmark called MetaWorld, which is a benchmark for adaptive robot learning. The key question for MetaWorld is how can we realistically measure inter-skill adaptation performance? So our goals were, you know, we want to measure the performance of the state of the art, but we always also wanted to create a challenge to strive for, something that wasn't fully solvable yet. What we ended up with was 50 realistic manipulation tasks in three different tiers of difficulty. And of course, the relationship to my thesis here is that by advancing these benchmarks, we challenge both the systems and the methods. MetaWorlds appeared in 276 publications. Um, it continues to be a project that we've worked on for multiple years, and there are um, new versions coming out soon. Okay, and then the next node in our journey is gonna be uh, baselines. So during the MetaWorld project, one thing I really learned is that current methods for adaptive RL are really not up to such a large challenge. They did, in MetaWorld, they did really good on the intra-skill adaptation. You know, different goals within a skill, the current methods did really well. But in skill adaptation, for instance, going from opening a drawer to closing a drawer, they really did quite poorly. We also learned in MetaWorld that the current systems used for implementing these methods, you know, the code and, and the, uh, yeah, the code itself was really not up to the challenge. Uh, MetaWorld has 50 skills in 2,500 different configurations. Previous benchmarks mostly had a single skill with very, very simple variations. Um, and at that scale, the current systems just really, really struggled uh, to, implement to implement the methods in a way that we could actually test them and run them on MetaWorld. It really was not practical to do empirical rest, uh, research on current methods with MetaWorld. Additionally, the systems that we had all used different implementation decisions uh, for some of the for these algorithms, which really affect the performance a lot of reinforcement learning algorithms, and they had different definitions of hyperparameters. Uh, which make it very, very difficult to compare things empirically apples to apples. So this led me to, along with others, to develop a system that's actually capable of implementing methods for such large challenges and to do so reproducibly. And this system is called Garage. So for the past three years, I'd led development and supervised a team of five to 10 students at a time to build this reinforcement learning library called Garage for tackling these larger robot learning problems. Now, the key question for Garage is how can we define, modify, disseminate, and reproduce complex RL experiments? And in order to achieve that, you know, it, its design goals include like modularity and flexibility. We wanted it to be reliable and correct so that the experiments we do are reproducible. We wanted to emphasize researcher productivity so we could attract and retain users, which is very important for critical mass. Um, and unlike most RL libraries, the development model is community-led. It's not led by a corporation. And this means that if we keep it community-led, that Garage can always track the state of the art and the needs of the robot learning community, not the internal agenda of any single company. And you can see on the diagram on the right that the popularity growth of Garage is really keeping pace with uh, software development in much larger organizations with dedicated engineering and marketing resources. So I think it's, it's really been a great success so far. And of course, the relationship to my thesis is that it, by advancing the systems, we can enable new methods. Now, uh, Garage really has everything you need to do to do complex RL experiments. Um, it has all the trappings of an open source library like your NumPy or your SciPy or your ROS, such as like regular releases, documentation, comprehensive test suites. And importantly, it has a large baseline library of high quality implementations of the existing approaches. 
Um, it's designed to break apart an RL learning system into single purpose components, such that each component is easy to understand on its own. To make new methods, you combine components in flexible and sometimes unexpected ways. And by modifying, and, and to make a new method, you can modify or add new ones as need, add new components as needed. So this system allows small methodological changes to be implemented as small code changes. And that makes it easier, easier to understand and easier to debug and easier to disseminate new approaches. Now, of course, once we had Garage, we used it to implement the state-of-the-art approaches for adaptive RL. And we used it to kind of understand this interskill learning problem. What we found is that more complex adaptive RL methods were not outperforming more simple approaches. In fact, using statistical, statistical significance tests, we showed that 75% of the observed differences uh, between these state-of-the-art methods could be explained by random variation. And up to 40% of the remaining performance differences were explainable by actually by small implementation decisions, which were not specified via the algorithm definitions themselves. So this is a, I think this is a really big reason. These results are a really big reason why we should focus on shared baseline systems. Okay, moving along on our journey. The study of garage, this, this garage study of these uh, state-of-the-art methods for interskill adaptation really pushed me to focus on simple methods with clear measurable performance benefits. And so the first of those methods that I'm really going to talk about today is called Never Stop Learning. So Never Stop Learning is a very simple way of doing continual adaptation for off-policy RL. And this work was done in collaboration with Google Brain while I was an intern and a student researcher there. So the key question for Never Stop Learning is how can we use data and pre-trained models from one task or skill to greatly accelerate learning of another task or skill, much like we would fine tune a vision or a language model. Now the conclusion we had from this is yes, you can actually do this with reasonable amounts of data, even though people had really struggled to do fine tuning with off policy RL before. Uh, we did find that actually most fine tuning methods from vision and language don't really work for reinforcement learning and robot learning. And we also found that the pre-training task and the method really matter a lot. Now, a big highlight of this method is because we're interested in building blocks for continual learning is that we can, find, we can use this method to fine tune repeatedly and create with, with uh, excuse me, we can use this method to fine tune uh, robot manipulation skills repeatedly uh, with no performance loss over simply fine tuning them once. And this is a really important property or building block for having a continual learner. So the relationship to my thesis is that this is like a simple scalable method for continual intra-task adaptation. Now, taking a stack back once more, kind of referred to this earlier in the presentation. End-to-end um, -end reinforcement learning has like lots has had lots of successes, but it mostly still looks like supervised learning. So, what do you do if you want to learn uh, teach a robot how to do something? Well, first, you collect a bunch of data. You learn from that data. You deploy a mo you deploy that model once you've learned. You might do the learning and the data collection uh, in a loop. You might learn data collect, learn data collect, but eventually you deploy the model. And for most learning robots in the world today. That's the end of the story. When you deploy the robot, it doesn't, uh, you don't use any of the successes or failures that you see during deployment generally to improve, to improve the robot. Deployment is a separate stage and training is a different stage. We wanna live in a world where training and deployment are the same stage. We wanna learn continually. So Never Stop Learning takes a step back and focuses on a simple, like bites a little piece off of the edge of this problem. It looks at intra skill adaptation. So taking a single manipulation skill, in this case, grasping, and trying to figure out how to continually adapt through changes to that task. And, uh, and it's based on the observation that the real world really has nearly infinite variation of different settings, different tasks, different objects. And so even if you were able to collect a large enough data set for many of these categories, users, or users of robots are still going to demand immediate performance on you know, novel tasks and settings. So, we need, so it's guided by the idea that we really need adapting robots to be able to put robots into the real world. So like I said, we're gonna take a first step towards this world. We're gonna change one thing. All the experiments in this project will change one thing about the robot, the task, or the environment. When we do that, the robot's going to fail. We're going, to, uh, we're going to take that failure, we're going to collect data on it, on the successes and failures under the new setting, and we're going to use that data to improve. And hopefully we'll do this repeatedly. And I'll talk about this a little bit more, the repeated setting, a little bit later in the presentation. So for the purposes of the experiments uh, in this work, you can see on the left, our baseline task is indiscriminate grasping. So the robot on the left succeeds if it grasps any object in the bin, 
And it's really good at that. You can see it gets 94% success on a set of held up test objects that it's never seen before. So it's, it's really, really good at indiscriminate grasping. Now on the right-hand side, you can see one of the challenges we'll see in this, in this work. So we put a checkerboard backing behind this robot's workspace, and that drops the success rate down to 50%. Our job is gonna be to get to, with a little bit of data and a little bit of cleverness, get the performance of the robot back up to 90% success or more, back up to that baseline success rate, which is what you see on the right. Now, another quick preliminary for this work is that everything we're talking about here is based on an off-policy reinforcement learning algorithm for robotics called QTOpt. QTOpt is very similar to DeepQ networks or DeepQN, if you happen to be familiar with the work. And this is the algorithm that was used by DeepMind to play Atari games with superhuman skill. By off-policy uh, and Q-learning, what I really mean is that uh, this system collects experience in the forms of successes and failures at the task, in this case, grasping. It uses those successes and failures to learn what we call a Q function. So a Q function ranks the expected return of a given action at a given state, in a given situation. It says that if you're in this state, this action is good, this action is better, this action is worse. Unlike DQN, it doesn't learn a, policy, a separate policy conditioned on that Q function that, that maximizes the return. Instead, when DQN needs, so excuse me, extend, when QT op needs an action, it uses the cross entry method to optimize the Q function online to choose the highest performing action, the highest rated action. And so Q is the only learned element in this system. When we go on, I might refer to Q, function, Q functions and policies in this system uh, interchangeably, and that's why. It's because given a Q, you're going to end up with the same policy anyway. Okay, so now we started, we started our study, and the first thing we need to do, of course, is we need a benchmark. So we started by creating a challenge. Uh, and this was actually hard because visual end-to-end -end reinforcement learning we found is uh, surprisingly robust. So we found no change in performance from most, uh, most backgrounds, most new objects, slightly breaking the gripper, making normal lighting changes, even offsetting the gripper's position from the end effector by up to five centimeters had zero impact on performance. But after enough hacking and enough banging on it, we did find some things that could break this robot. And we used them to create a challenge. So here are the ones we found. We found that, uh, we found that uh, transparent objects really mess with the system. It's very difficult to discern them from the background. We found that if we chose, put adversarial patterns behind the robot's workspace, in this case, a checkerboard pattern, we could drop its performance. We also found that uh, some modifications to the gripper that would simulate uh, wear and tear, such as this one, which uh, decreases the gripper's compliance, uh, could make it work, uh, make the system not work as well. We found that very harsh changes to lighting, extremely harsh changes to this lighting, could cause the system's performance to drop. And we also found, and this is by far my favorite, that five centimeters offset for the gripper has uh, no impact on performance. But if you go so far as to offset the gripper by 10 centimeters, uh, then, you and you make this ridiculous Franken robot, uh, then you can compromise the performance of the system. So here are the overall success rates for each of these challenges using the base grasping policy, base grasping Q function. And each of these represents a real from a variation we'd expect to see uh, for we expect real robots to see in the real world. So I think this is a really good challenge. And just as a quick peek, here's what our robot sees. Uh, during these challenges. So for instance, in the, in the bottom middle, you can see that the harsh lighting uh, really blows out a huge part of the robot's workspace for the camera. You can see that on the lower right-hand side, the transparent bottles are pretty difficult to discern from the background, especially if, you know, if you're not a human with a great vision system. Now, once we had our challenge, we did, what did we do next? Well, we started looking at our baselines, i.e. the state of the art. And what we really wanted is a system that would act like fine tuning does uh, in supervised learning. Now by fine tuning, what I mean is taking a network or a function you already, a learned function you already have, pre-trained on a general purpose task and reusing it to learn a new task. Usually this takes the form of initializing your algorithm with the parameters of the pre-training and then applying more gradients or more uh, optimization update procedures to this, to these parameters using new data. And typically you also do things like turn down the learning rate so you don't change the parameters too quickly. Fine tuning is like a large body of techniques in supervised learning. There's many different ways you can fine tune, many different modifications you can make on it. We'd really like RL to work like this, uh, by the way, because training, uh, because using RL to train robots is of course very expensive. And we couldn't cover all possibilities, but we did some case studies. 
we tried a lot of things. We tried things like um, adding a head to the queue function. We tried training only some layers. We tried reinitializing some layer, only some layers. We tried training using only batch norms. We also tried some variations on sampling. And we found that most of these state-of-the-art techniques for fine tuning from supervised learning just are either not that effective, not, not more effective than the vanilla version of fine tuning for re off-policy reinforcement learning, or that they were actually destructive. And so here's an example of a destructive one and a reason why you can't always take techniques from supervised learning and try to use them for reinforcement learning or for robot learning. So a, popular, a very, very popular transfer learning approach in supervised learning uh, is called uh, multi-headed networks or adding a head. Essentially, you consider the bulk of, the, of, of a function approximator at the network to be the body. And we imagine chopping off the head. So like the last one or two layers. And, and, uh, and we wanna, we, when we wanna learn a new task, we add a new head and we fine tune only the parameters for that new head. So the presumption here is that the body of the network encodes some, uh, some important features, excuse me, important features for, uh, for learning your new, new, new task. And all you, need to do is to, all you need to do is to learn to use those new features in the new head. Now, this is very appealing. We'd really like reinforcement learning to work, work with this. Uh, but what we found is that uh, it actually does not work very well for reinforcement learning. And the reason is that reinforcement learning needs to explore. But doing such a thing, or really doing anything that would reinitialize the parameters inside any layer of one of these networks, destroys the, the robot's ability to explore in its new task. Its behavior reverts to random, and random behavior is not great for generating good data for fine-tuning on the new tasks. If it can't explore, it can't collect useful data on the new task, and that means it can't fine-tune effectively. So this exploration problem will actually appear again in the next project I talk about. So if all these things didn't work, well, what did work? Well, here's what did work, and let me tell you about it. So this process, again, is based on QTOpt, and it's very, very simple. And I want to emphasize that it's completely offline. In order to do this, you need three ingredients. You need a pre-trained policy or Q function. You need success and failure data on the new task. And you need the data that was used for pre-training. So to take you on a little tour on this diagram, let's we'll start at one with pre-training. Use the offline data set to pre-train our key function for this grasping task. And once we're done with that, we have a robot which can grasp with 86% success rate. Now we're going to try to adapt. So we go to two, where we have a new task. In this case, we this is the offset ripper challenge. Now we take that base Q function that we learned, the one just for grasping, and we use it to explore in this new task. This is important because this exploration generates, uh, exploration with this Q function generates much more useful data than random exploration. So we use it to explore in the new task. And in this case, we collect about 800 gra uh, grasp attempts, which takes between two to four hours to collect. And these attempts have about a 43% success rate. Now, now that we have data, it's time to adapt. So we take the learning process and we initialize it with the parameters of the base Q function, the same parameters, the same Q function that we use for exploration. Now, if at this point you were to simply run vanilla fine tuning, and by that I mean you take the target data, you turn down the learning rate, and you update the initialized Q function using only the new data, you'd very, very quickly destroy the parameters of your Q function and end up with a policy, a robot, executing a policy that does not work very well for either task. The reason is that this new data is very small and it doesn't contain enough diversity to represent everything you need to know for the grasping task. So if you update your parameters with it, you're gonna just, you have a classic case of overfitting. You're just going to overfit directly to this new task, but unfortunately you'll overfit so far that you won't actually be able to do grasping. So our technique, never stop learning, says instead you can do something very simple. Rather than using only the target data, you can sample with 50% probability from a bucket containing the target data and a bucket containing the much, much larger base data set that you originally trained your system with. This forces your optimizer to learn a Q function, which well represents both the base grasping task and its variation. It forces it to find a function which satisfies both of those. And because we're doing intra-task adaptation, both of these tasks are almost identical structurally. So this, uh, this is very effective. And this gets, this, uh, gets our learner back up to 98% success rate. Now, I want to reemphasize that this process is completely offline. We only collect the data once, and we only use the base Q function to do it. The target Q function, the target policy, never explored the environment. OK, so now that I've showed you how the method works, let's, talk, let's, talk to, let's look at some experiments. And everything I'm going to show, and here, uh, just as a, as a reminder, these are the, these are the initial success rates on these challenge tasks for this method. 
And in the following videos, you'll see before adaptation is always on the left and after is always on the right. Okay, so here's the checkerboard challenge where we put a checkerboard behind the robot's workspace. Now the robot was trained without any, any such checkerboard. And so this is a little bit adversarial. And you can actually see the failure mode here is kind of funny. The robot uh, can't, uh, seems to think that checkerboard edges are objects. And so it's grasping at the checkerboard edges and trying to pick them up. After our procedure and just uh, two to four hours of, of practice and a little bit of uh, a little bit of gradients offline, you can see that the uh, the fine tune policy gets up to ninety eight percent. Sorry, excuse me, ninety percent success rate, which is essentially the baseline success rate. Okay, so now on a much harder challenge, harsh lighting. So you can see uh, you can see that the pre trained policy on the left here um, has another fun failure mode. Um, this. Uh, the, the lighting that this robot was trained with wasn't enough to generate reflections in the bin, but this lighting is very harsh and very and very intense. So it generates reflections in the bin. And the failure mode here is that the robot sees its own reflection and starts grasping at that reflection as though it's an object. Now on the right-hand side, you can see after our fine tuning procedure, we double our success rate approximately to 64%. So we haven't, uh, we haven't gotten all the way up to the baseline, although I'm not sure that's exactly possible because we've blown out a lot of the camera's contrast with this light. But what we have done is eliminate the failure mode where the robot grasps it at its own at its own reflection. And then my last example, and by, and by far my favorite, as always, is the offset gripper. So you can see here on the left, the offset gripper has a very predictable uh, failure mode. It has bad aim. And, uh, and, on, and that makes sense because we offset it by 10 centimeters. And on the right-hand side, you can see that after our fine tuning procedure, we've actually been able to get the robot success rate all the way up to 98% success, which is, which is uh, um, yeah, which is actually larger than the original baseline success rate. Now, another thing we learned from this project is that reinforcement, pre-training with reinforcement learning really matters. And to, to learn about this, what we did is we, uh, we instead did, a, did an experiment where, we, where instead of pre-training with this reinforcement learning data set, we pre-trained with a really large supervised learning data set. In particular, we take our Q function and we pre-train it with, uh, with classification loss for ImageNet features. ImageNet is a very large image data set. And, uh, and we show, and, and you can see the results of that on the left here, right? So you can see that, so uh, you can see on the left here that pre-training with ImageNet and a little bit of uh, fine tuning uh, online. So to get our grasping, uh, to get our grasping skills, you can see the result on the left here. Um, and, and of course, yeah, it has 2% success rate, so it's not, that's not very impressive, but it actually does okay. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see that it's learned some really useful skills. It actually uh, servos into the bin, it servos towards different objects, and even closes this gripper and tries to pick them up. Uh, unfortunately, you don't need depth perception to solve the ImageNet classification challenge, and so this robot never learns depth perception, and so it's not able to actually pick things up, it just grasps in thin air. Now on the right-hand side, you can see the results of pre-training, excuse me, and fine-tuning, pre-training and fine-tuning with reinforcement learning data. And you can see that it's much more effective because we've, our pre-training learns features that are necessary for depth and for controlling a robot. Okay, so here are the overall results of using this method on our five challenges. You can see that there's across the board uh, performance improvements for all these methods, excuse me, for all these challenges. Uh, in some cases actually exceeding the baseline success rate. Now, I told you before that the point of this project was to get us towards continual learning. So once we have a single step of adaptation, of course, the next thing we do is we're gonna do it continually. <clears throat> so in this variation on the experiments, we're gonna retrain a single lineage of policies repeatedly. The pre-training process is gonna be exactly I described before. And the first adaptation will also be exactly the same as I described before. So in this case, in this example, we, pre we adapt to harsh lighting first. But at the end of the harsh lighting experiment, rather than starting again with pre-training to get to the transparent bottles challenge, we instead take the parameters of the harsh lighting Q function and we use those to initialize the fine tuning process for the transparent bottles challenge. And we do this over and over and over again uh, through, in this case, five steps, and we end up at the offset gripper challenge. So here's the result of doing this continual fine tuning process. And this is the offset gripper. So this policy has been fine-tuned five times since pre-training. And you can see that we get the offset gripper success rate up to 91% success. Recall that the single step was about 98% success. And this is really very close to the, to our, um, this is really very close to the precision limit of our ability to measure the success rate with these robots. So essentially our conclusion here is that continual fine-tuning doesn't really have any negative effect on the success rates. Uh, of uh, compared to single step fine tuning. And this is a really great property for continual learning building block to have. 
So again, the overall, the overall results for continual learning uh, are here. And you can see that, um, that they are very similar, uh, very similar to the success rates of the single step process. Essentially, there's, there's almost no performance impact to doing this continually. Okay, so conclusions from Never Stop Learning are uh, that offline fine tuning is a really promising building block for continual learning. And it's promising because for the following reasons. One, it's fast. So everything you saw here only took one to four hours of additional practice. Uh, about 0.2% of the original data of uh, the, the, the original data set for training these robots was, uh, was uh, actually many robot months of, of robot experience. Uh, the procedure is very simple. So this is really barely different from regular training, which makes it uh, scalable, easy to integrate, easy to use, and easy to understand. And the process is repeatable. This works in a continual setting, and it has almost no performance penalty. Now, the previous project, Never Stop, Stop Learning, showed that we can, do, we can use a simple method for intra-skill adaptation. I have a single skill, its circumstances change, and I want to adapt to it. This next project here, Skill Builder, will talk about a simple method towards tackling inter-skill adaptation. And this is the most recent work that I've worked on uh, with several collaborators here at USC. So the key question for Skill Builder is, how do we, can, how do we continually learn manipulation skills? if we can only store policies. Now, we want to only store policies because storing all data is not always practical in general. And if we're recording all that experience, it would quickly become impractical to store all of that locally. It would be even less practical to transmit it to other robots or, or to a cloud, right? So, Given the, also, given the success of these large pre-trained models that are in use in language and vision, we want to see how far we can get with just parameters. Now, I acknowledge that the best continual learning robot will probably use a mix of both parameters and data. But I really think that studying only the parameters is really a word we call so we can understand what's going on just in their isolation. So again, the key question here is how can we continually learn manipulation skills if we only store policies? And some conclusions we have from this study are one, but there seems to be an exploration problem. That is that reusing the policy behavior is just as important as reusing the parameters. So recall and never stop learning. We also reuse both the policy behavior and the parameters. And can, we also show that continual learning in this, in our skill builder setting, our particular setting, excuse me, can be reduced to inference on the skill skill curriculum. So some highlights of this project, it, it's uh, the method we introduced is really simple. It uses only on policy, on policy story, and life um, it, it's, uh, it never forgets. So the, this property is actually built into the formulation. And uh, with a good curriculum, we show that it can be trained from scratch if it uses a particular offline curriculum procedure, which we define in, in the work. And of course, the relationship to the thesis here is that this, this takes us towards a simple, scalable method for continual inter-task adaptation. Okay, so what is Skill Builder? So Skill Builder is really a framework, not really a fully specified algorithm. And we consider several variations in the paper, each of which can be considered. Might learn some tasks, they might learn them independently and one at a time, or it might learn them jointly. However it learns them, it saves the skill policies that were used to, so to solve these tasks. Now we're continual learning robot. So the next stage is that we're going to adapt and learn a new task. And in skill builder, the way that we learn a new task is that we draw on the previous skill skills that we saved in our skill library. Excuse me. At the at the end of our at the end of our pre-training, we're going to take our skill policies and we're going to save them in the skill library. And then in the robot's going to reuse that skill library. When it goes to adapt to learn a new task, it's going to draw on the skills it has in that skill library. It's going to use them both for exploration, so both their behaviors, and for optimization. It's going to use their parameters. Now, once it's, once it's done using the behaviors and parameters of these skills for adaptation, and it has a good policy, a good skill, or skills for the new task, it's going to save those skills back into the library. And the next time we go to adapt, our library will be larger. So for the purposes of this particular, of what I'm going to present today for skill builder, we need to answer some questions to have for outcome. So the first question we need to answer is, how are we going to reuse those skill policies? So in this work, we're going to just try our best to pick a single good policy to start with. But I'll give you a sneak peek at something a little bit more clever later. 
And the next question we have to answer is, what we have chosen the policy how we adapt it. In this work, we use on policy fine tuning with PPL, an algorithm called proximal policy optimization, a pretty simple on policy RL algorithm. But you could actually use almost any RL or adaptation algorithm, um, including something like never stop learning, like I showed you before. And notice that by construction, this framework can never forget, which is one of our desiderata from the beginning of the presentation. And it can't forget because it always stores the skill policies for each task, which it can later recall. This also means that you can return to previous skill policies and improve upon them if you'd like. So we've already actually satisfied two desiderata from our, for continual learning from very right way in the beginning of the presentation. We can learn new tasks and we don't forget. What's left to do is to do this efficiently. So we show in this work and in this setting that in this setting, you can reduce the efficient continual learning program problem, which was one, our third desiderata to choosing the right skill to skill curriculum. To show this, we calculate offline a simple skill skill transfer cost metric for each pair of tasks. And you can see that metric uh, portrayed on this, this heat map matrix here. We show that if you have such a matrix, you have such a metric, you can arrange your desired skills and their transitions into a graph with the skills as the leaf nodes and the cost as the edge weights. And then given this graph, you can solve for the most efficient curriculum give, uh, using a minimum, sp minimum spanning tree algorithm, which minimizes the path cost to reaching all of the skills. Now, in this case, we use training speed improvement over fine tuning. Uh, excuse me, we use the training speed improvement of fine tuning compared to learning from scratch as our cost. Of course, it's negated because it's a cost. But any metric which orders skill to skill transitions by their sample complexity will do. For instance, you could use a heuristic for your, for your particular space of tasks, or you can learn such an inference function from your task space during pre-training. You could also do online inference, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Okay, so we have a cost metric for our skill to skill, for the skill to skill uh, advantage between, uh, for fine tuning between different tasks. And we put it into this minimum spanning tree algorithm to generate curriculums. So on the right hand side here, you can actually see a couple of these curriculums we generated for a 10 skill uh, continual learning campaign. You can see the optimal one in the middle. And actually we uh, observed that because we have this uh, spanning tree based algorithm, we can just invert the edge weights and also output a pessimal curriculum. I think we can learn some really interesting things from, by just looking at these curriculums actually. And I think the results are surprising. So most works on, cur on curriculum generation uh, learn simpler skills first and then attempt to generalize, generalize them to harder tasks. But these curriculums say that if you have a fixed budget for pre-training, you should actually spend it on the hardest tasks instead. You know, so for instance, in this optimal diagram in the middle, it says if you'd like to pre-train, if you only have the budget to pre-train three tasks out of 10, you should learn first, peg insert, pick in place, and push, We're actually, which are actually empirical, the th empirically the three hardest tasks uh, in this 10 task set. And the pessimal curriculum uh, uh, contrasting tells us what not to do. It says, don't spend your budget on easy tasks. Uh, also observe that the pessimal curriculum continually switches between easier tasks and harder tasks, such as going from drawer close, which is very easy to peg insert side, which is very hard. Because uh, if you use an easier task as your exploration basis for a harder task, it barely helps you explore the harder task. So for me, one thing I really learned from, from, uh, from from solving for these curriculums is the primacy of exploration. That hard skills are hard because of exploration and easier skills don't really help with that. So everything we've done here has been completely offline and, um, and outside, outside of the experimental domain. So now, well, now we're, gonna, we're gonna do, well, actually not totally outside because we had to use experiments to generate our cost metric, of course. But, uh, but now, now what we need to do is we need to take these curriculums and we need to use them in experiments. So starting from the top, you can see the, the orange lines are the pessimal curriculum, both the predicted and dotted in the actual, uh, actual in, um, in solid. And you can see the pessimal curriculum is really, really bad. Because uh, if, you go uh, if you go down to the red, if you go down to the red uh, part of, excuse me, if you go down to the red series in this plot here, you can see that the, uh, you can see that the red line which is, uh, which is the result of choosing your skill skill transitions randomly is actually way worse than the green line. And the green line is, uh, is just training all of your skills from scratch. There's no skill skill transitions or continual learning. You just train each of your skills from scratch. Now I wanna pause here because I realized that I forgot to explain this plot and I think it requires a little bit of explanation. So on this plot, the success rate 
uh, is on the x-axis because the success rate in this case is the independent variable. This plot says that if you would like some percentage of success on the x-axis, you will need the amount of samples during continual learning on the y-axis. And so, of course, lower lines are better. So uh, going back to our explanation, the green line here represents learning all of your tasks from scratch. You just, you don't do anything continual. Uh, your continual learning algorithm is learn a task and add it to your library, but you never reuse them. Now the blue dotted line is the predicted sample efficiency of the skill builder method using our, uh, using our optimal offline generated curriculum. And then the blue triangles are actual experiments when we execute that curriculum during, uh, during continual learning. Now, as you can see, the blue uh, some of the blue triangles are actually below the green line. And so this shows us that yes, a uh, skill builder with the skill curriculum can perform more efficiently than simply learning from scratch. So using this framework, we actually have satisfied our three desires. We can learn continually, we can learn without forgetting, and we can be more efficient for training from scratch. Now notice that some of the green triangles here are above the blue line. That's because some of the, because that's because the skill kill transitions each have some probability of a failure to train due to the properties of training neural networks. And if this fine tuning fails, we're forced to learn that task from scratch so that we can continue on to the next task. And that creates a penalty in our efficiency. So something we can learn from this experiment here is that for better continual learning, our adaptation procedure really needs to degrade gracefully or abort bad, uh, bad choices quickly. It needs to be robust to the skill to skill transfer, transfer failure, and it needs to maintain our ability to explore in the new task. Now, everything you've, used, you've seen so far used an exhaustively computed offline cost metric for curriculums. And obviously this is not ideal. So, and we also saw before that we really want our adaptation procedure to degrade gracefully. We want it to be robust to the wrong choice of base skill, possibly by considering multiple candidate base skills. And we wanna preserve our ability to explore. So one thing you could do to, uh, to get these properties is during pre-training, you could learn an inference function for skill to skill, for, uh, you can learn an inference function that infers your skill to skill cost metric, and you could use it for online skill selection, and then abort quickly if adaptation isn't going well. Now there's a small amount of work on prior, a small amount of prior work on doing this, but it shows that learning such an inference function requires pre-training on a very large number of tasks, which is not very appealing because we want to uh, reduce the cost of training these robot policies. So we're, uh, so at the conclusion of skill builder, now I want to I emphasize this is preliminary works. So this is just a little sneak peek. We ask, what if you could do inference on the best exploration behavior and parameters for a task online while also learning that task? And what we're working with here is a policy class and a pre-training, what we're proposing here is a policy class and a pre-training procedure, which is inspired by recent work on imitation learning for computer graphics. And, uh, and in addition to that inspiration, we also add an adaptation procedure and a way of adding new skills. So the way that this works is that during pre-training, rather than jointly learning a single skill independently for each task, we jointly learn the tasks and the skills as a many-to-many -many mapping. So you can see there's a skill library on the left, and on the right, you see this mixing, mixing function W, one for each task, which learns to mix the skills to complete the task. Now W is a state condition function, which generates a weight for each skill, and we combine the skills uh, probability mass functions as a weighted product of this W vector. We pre-train that everything jointly, uh, including the mixing, the Victor's Ryan's connection dropped. Oh, well, what happened? <laughs> Ryan's connection appears to have dropped. Um, Let's give him a second to come back. Does he know? He, does he know he's off? I, I assume Luis will tell him. Okay. Because she was also here and also. This is the most uh, traumatic. Depends. <laughs> 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 He'll reconnect. He'll reconnect soon. Yeah, I have a feeling he may not may not realize that he's speaking into the void.
I'm sorry, I think we had some technical difficulties. Can people hear me and see me? Yes. Uh, okay, can somebody tell me where we left off? Just towards the end of this slide. Ah, okay. So I was talking, giving you a little sneak peek of uh, a method that we're thinking about using with Skill Builder to enable this online uh, curriculum. And I, and I wanna, again, reemphasize this is preliminary work. This is more of a sneak peek. Uh, so, uh, Right, so we can, um, we pre-train all of these skills and their mixing functions jointly to ensure that the skills decompose the tasks and that they're learned in a way which makes them amenable to composi comp composition in the future. And then uh, this is new, to learn a new task, we fix the skills, but we rapidly learn a new W function for that task because W is a much smaller function to learn. Now you can also imagine variations where we update the existing skills or we add new ones during adaptation. Now here's what a pre-training looks like with a system like this. Uh, so on the top, you see a policy, that, uh, the, a policy being executed that we have pre-trained using this method. And then the bottom in blue, you see skills that, that, are, uh, that were learned during this pre-training process. So uh, going from left to right, you can see in the, uh, on the first, uh, for, the, for the first skill, uh, the system learned to decompose uh, a skill which, which uh, simply tries to grasp the peg. Sorry, this robot is trying to grasp and insert a peg in a box. In the second position, you can see that there is a skill that's used once the robot has grasped a peg to raise the peg. In the third position, you can see the skill that's been learned uh, to simply move around the sides of the box to try to locate the hole to insert the peg into. And lastly, you can see a fourth skill, which has been decomposed, which inserts the peg once it's find the correct, found the correct position. Now, if we look at another policy for another, another task, which was jointly pre-trained with the previous one, so both of these were pre-trained at the same time. These are two tasks that change at the same time and using the same skill library. You can see in the left uh, at the bottom in the, with the blue skills that the skill that we learned to actually, the, excuse me, that this policy reuses the grasping skill. And instead it's trying to grasp a ball because this task is to pick up a ball and drop it in a basket. So it's reusing the grasping skill to try to grasp find and grasp a ball. You can also see in the second position, it reuses the raising skill because you can raise a ball or you can raise a peg and it needs to raise the ball to put it in the basket. And then in the third position, you can see there's a skill that isn't used by peg insert, which is to move to the basket, which is the last stage of performing this task. Now, our hope for this is, uh, is that what we really wanna see is this skill reuse property. And, you, and here's another great example of this property. So again, these, these be, what you're seeing are rollouts for policies for two tasks, pick and place, where you're supposed to pick up a, a block and bring it to a position, and sweep, where the robot is simply supposed to push a block to the side of, of the workspace. Um, and you can see that because we did this skill sharing pre-training, in pre-training, the, uh, the sweep policy actually, instead of learning how to sweep, just simply picks up the block because it already has the skill it needs for the harder task, which is, which is pick and place. And so it just decides to use that skill during pre-training by virtue of the policy gradient loss uh, on, on, this, uh, on this policy class. On the right-hand side, you can see what happens if we take the same pre-training and adapt to actually a, a test that's quite hard, which is pushing. The robot is supposed to push the block to a particular position. Um, and this, this task is surprisingly hard. It takes 5 million uh, steps to learn this from scratch. But the policy you see on the right was actually only learned in 50,000 steps. And the reason is that it only needed to learn a W function. And that, that W function simply learned to reuse the, uh, some of the skills used by pick and place. Because though uh, pick and placing and pushing are not the same thing, you can satisfy the pushing reward function by using the pick and place skills. It picks up the block instead of pushing it and puts, and puts it into the place because the, uh, the push reward function actually only rewards you for getting the block to the place. It doesn't specify how. Okay, so some conclusions from Skill Builder are that uh, continual learning is hard, but it doesn't have to be complicated. So the framework I just showed you is very simple. It's composed of a skill library on policy reinforcement learning and curriculum learning, curriculum generation. It's, it's, uh, it's efficient. So uh, during, in the best continual learning runs, we, get, we are using 50% of the scratch samples. And in the median, I would say that we're using about 80% of the scratch samples. And that's with no pre-training. If there was a pre-training process, we would probably use far, far fewer samples. And the last property of Skill Builder is that it's scalable. There's no data to save and adaptation accelerates with the new tasks. Okay, so we're the, almost to the end of our journey. And this is where I will give some uh, insights into how I think we should proceed for the future. So future directions for research, I think uh, one is 
a really important future direction for research is incorporating strong priors about the real world. So other successful areas of AI, such as language, vision, decision support, et cetera, those disciplines use huge data sets from the real world. And those data sets allow them to encode strong priors on the natural world. And those priors make it much easier to adapt to new samples from the real world. Contrasting that with everything you've seen in this presentation, this robot has only ever seen its own experiences. Um, another, another future direction I think would be, will be very important is skill reuse and structured exploration. So hopefully I've convinced you that these two capabilities are really key for building efficient, continually learning robots. And I really think that skill reuse and structured exploration are still the path forward. But surprise, but there's actually, uh, but there's actually there's surprisingly little work going on in this area. There is work going on in this area, but much less than I would expect. Um, and the last, I think, really important future direction will be bridging the gap between discrete intent and continuous control. So uh, one theme from a lot of the works that you've seen in this presentation is that human intentions, such as uh, tasks like opening the door or picking up the cup, uh, those are discrete. But robots and the controllers they live in, the robots and their controllers, they live in a continuous world. So this poses a really big problem when you want to translate high-level intent into low-level controllers, into one or more low-level controllers. Because predicting whether a continuous controller gets you closer to, to your discrete intent is actually a really hard problem. And this was actually recently summarized by, uh, by proposals for this research area people are calling TAMP, Task and, and Motion Planning. And then these are my prescriptive recommendations. So for, for uh, like immediately immediate new work. So I really think that uh, benchmarks, we should really have simple benchmarks with high diversity that are grounded in reality. That's what I really learned from this exercise. Simple benchmarks are more likely to be adopted. They're more interpretable. Um, the world is diverse, so benchmarks should be diverse. And it's important we don't lose sight of our purpose, which is uh, real robots doing well in the real world. And that means the benchmarks need to be grounded in reality. Um, I also believe that we should really have a bias for simple methods and shared sim systems. Simpler methods, simpler methods scale better, they make better building blocks, and they're easier to understand. And I also believe on the system side that robot learning is rapidly approaching a point where it's impractical to do good empirical research by creating your own system. So I think we're really approaching the point where we really need shared systems, sort of similar to ROS or other, other uh, shared software systems used for robot research uh, to help us do uh, continue to accelerate robot learning. And the last one is a little bit more nuanced, but I call it robotics as machine learning, not robotics for machine learning. So many of the methods you see in this presentation were inspired by work, often in language and vision. But many, many methods trying to translate, they actually don't work very well, or they required large modifications to work with robotics. So for instance, consider like never stop learning. Other areas of AI, and the reason is because other areas of AI live in a fundamentally different regime. Um, they make assumptions which don't apply to robotics, such as the stationarity of the world, or that we can have access to globally representative data sets of everything we would care about. So I think future robot learning research should really, start, should really start from first principles. It should consider problems that are central to robotics, such as active learning and continual learning, and address robotics from that direction, as a field of machine learning, as opposed to in the reverse direction, as an application of machine learning to robotics. Okay, with that, Here's uh, the list of papers that I've worked on during my time here in my PhD program. I'd really like to thank my, my advisor, Gaurav, um, also Carol, uh, my committee here. Uh, thank you all so much for being here today and for supporting me through this. Um, all the collaborators that I've worked with who were, um, all this work really would not, would not have been possible with all the help of lots of all these other people. And of, I'd like to also thank all the students I've had the great privilege of advising during this time. Um, and I'd also like to thank my family and my girlfriend, Louise, for, uh, for all their support they've given me over these four years. Um, and with that, I'll take questions. All right, wonderful. Okay, so uh, let's move to the next phase. Uh, let's have questions from non-committee members first. And so let's begin there and then we'll, we'll move over to committee questions. So let's see, any takers from non-committee members? Go ahead. Uh, hi, Ryan, it was a good talk. I have a question. You advocate for uh, benchmarks. And in my experience, people only construct benchmarks where they can easily label things or solve things. And sometimes they're really hard tasks. 
it's hard to get benchmarks for. So for example, in your case, your robots never pick up anything too heavy because you know they have some sort of mass limit on what they are, some sort of weight limit on what they can pick up, right? You don't pick mm -hmm. up 20 pound objects. So I'm wondering if you think that benchmarks are still useful when benchmarks can due to human like ease of use tend to be constructed such that they are solvable. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. Um, and I think I think you point out a really a really big, big problem with designing benchmarks, which is that you need to be able to actually execute your benchmark uh, in some reasonable amount of time or effort. And this can, and as you point out, this can really uh, this can really guide how people decide decide to design their benchmarks. Often they make them. I think that you're maybe alluding to they make them a little bit too easy to satisfy because that's just the best thing that we can design. Um, and uh, there, that's that's the, as far as we can get, you know, with designing a benchmark that you could actually execute. You know, for instance, it'd probably be difficult to make a real life benchmark for autonomous driving because it requires executing a real uh, autonomous car, right? Um, and yeah, so I think this is a real issue in benchmarks. Um, I think that there's no there are no simple solutions, but I think that the um, I think that our our best path forward is is again to ground them in reality, and uh, and this this require this really means that. Uh, when people are proposing new benchmarks and those benchmarks are being assessed by the community, I think that this grounding in reality needs to continue to be the guiding principle. It needs to be the North Star because every benchmark is always going to be a simplification of a real problem. So the question is, which parts do you simplify and which parts, which parts do you, do you uh, keep as the hard part? And that is, um, that's really a judgment call on the, on the, the, uh, on, on the part of the people who are going to be assessing future benchmarks, which are generally members of the community who decide to use them or not, or occasionally they might appear under peer review. Um, but I do think that that doesn't totally address uh, that doesn't totally address the problem because there are just some things that you can't put in a completely reproducible benchmark. Um, and I think that the role that we could imagine for those, uh, which which is to say the things that are just um, that uh, could only be tested in the real world, and I think the way that we can address those is by um, having a different kind of benchmark, which are these, which are these challenges and competitions, which have become a pretty popular feature of recent robotics comp uh, conferences and occasionally machine learning conferences. And I think that's a really positive step because that actually does get the systems into the real world, uh, trying to work in situations which can't be predicted and which also can't be encoded with a simple uh, benchmark, which is often in simulation. Thank you. Thank you. No one else has a question. I have another. Go ahead. Um, See, so you also advocate for continual learning. And my question is, what do you do if you learn a bad skill? You learn a bad habit, much like people do. Sometimes they might learn a bad habit and those can be much harder to fix than something that, you know, learning some sort of new skill where humans can easily pick those up. Um, especially in the context of having many, many skills, right? So you can imagine maybe your robot grabs things too hard, and it's just a one step in a long pipeline, and eventually has to work on eggs, and it fails, and it might be very hard to debug why. So what do you think of, if you're advocating for continually learning, you might also learn something wrong or bad. And so do you think that's a problem, or do you have any ideas for how that might be fixed? Or do you think it's just, you know, it's like humans, we're just doomed to learn bad habits? <laughs> that's, that's a funny, um, that's a funny metaphor. Um, I think that it's, um, I think that, so it is a problem. I think it's real. Um, perhaps it's a, uh, it's a future problem instead of a right now problem. I think that it would be good to focus on getting good continual learning first. Uh, but I think that, that what you're saying is, is a really important point. And it means that we need to think about continue, um, designing continual learning systems, at least eventually, such that they update their skills or they continue to, uh, to excuse me, that they either update their skills, give a new experience, right? So if you use your skill and it breaks the egg, uh, then that is that should be bad for that skill, and we should update that skill. Let's not do that. Or, and this is really a core problem for the the decomposition adaptation style of learning I'm talking about. It might be that you have mapped the uh, grasp hard skill onto uh, picking up the egg, and but you lack a grasp gently skill, which is what you really need for picking up the egg. And so uh, the thing is that that uh, you. In order to solve that problem, you need to assess not the skills themselves, because the grasp hard skill is really good at grasping hard. So it's not necessarily a bad skill, but it's used in the wrong context. And so I think a core problem that, that always comes up in this decomposition work is uh, how do you separate measuring the skills from measuring their composition? And, how do, and how, do you, uh, how do you update them once you do that? So how do you know if you have a bad composition or a bad skill itself? Um, and I don't have any incredibly uh, 
incredibly insightful ideas about exactly how to do that. I think it's a really hard problem, but uh, but I think that uh, I think that it would probably involve uh, some notion of uh, continually monitoring your own performance uh, on these tasks, and and um, and you can imagine, for instance, in your egg example, uh, an idea could be that you can. Uh, periodically try to explore in the skill space. So you want to be high entropy in the skill space. You want to try to use as many different combinations of skills as possible to, you know, make an omelet. And, uh, and you might find that some variations are better than others. And maybe one variation uses the soft grasping skill and one variation uses the hard grasping skill, but you only find that out if you explore in the space of skills. I see. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That's all I have. Other questions from the floor? Ryan, do you just want to go back to your publication slide and leave that up so when the sure. questions start? Um, all right, going once, going twice. Any any other questions from non-committee members? Okay. So then what we'll do at this point is we'll just move into committee session um, and we'll end the public part of the defense here. Um, so I'd like uh, I'd like only the committee to please stay on the on the uh, meeting with Ryan. Uh, hey, sorry, I did have a question. I forgot to unmute. Ah, uh, go ahead and ask now. Uh, we've lost some of the audience, but uh, go for it. Sorry, all right. Uh, what was that robot arm you guys were using? Uh, depends on which one. Probably the Sawyer robot arm. The brown one. The brown one. Uh, uh, you were trying to put a peg through a hole. Oh, that's, that's a model of a Sawyer robot, yeah. A model, sorry? A model of the Sawyer robot. It uh, was made by Rethink Robotics, which is unfortunately defunct now. But uh, if you search for a Sawyer robot, you'll find it. We have one at USC and many, many simulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, still waiting for some people. Yeah, there's just takes a little while for yeah. everybody to disconnect. Okay, I removed the stragglers. So I think I, it's just the committee. I think it is just the committee. And so right. also, Ryan, can you turn off the recording? Oh, yes. Let's see. Stop recording.